Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to thank Mr. Weber for being here today and helping you through this. Um, I just put together a about a 20 minute uh, note taking session here just to introduce you to the idea of something called electronic configurations. Um, just to get up and ready here, make sure you have a pen and a paper a notebook out ready to go. You can start a new section in your notebook on electronic configurations and uh, you should have your periodic tables out and ready to go at this point in time um, so that you can refer to them. We'll take you through this uh, note-taking idea, give you the background on electronic configurations. Then after that, you'll have a practice sheet that you can work on in class, uh, and that worksheet will be due on Tuesday when we get back. Um, I want you to give it a try. Certainly, I'm not going to collect it for points right away, but we'll have a chance to work on it and complete it in class. But I do want you to, to work on it, come in with questions, comments, uh, or come in knowing how to do it. That would be the best bet yet. So let's just get started here um, at the top of your page. Just start out with the idea of electron configurations. Um, give you a couple definitions here. If at any point during the uh, video you need to pause it, Mr. Weber can do that for you. And then if you have questions as you go through or don't understand what phrase something means, um, he can help you out with that as well. Okay, so what we're going to look at today is electron configuration. The reason that we need this is as we get into chemical reactions, we're going to need to understand where the electrons are located in and around the atom because they're the things that are going to drive, uh, sorry, drive how a reactions take place uh, and the nature of those. So let's get the definition down here. Electron configurations represent the location and number of electrons traveling around the nucleus in what we call something called electron clouds. So we're going to be counting electrons and we're going to be placing them uh, really just like you have an address where you live. Uh, we actually assign addresses to each electron uh, within the atom. That's kind of the analogy that I use there. So this is the first idea uh, about electrons. And one of the things that you would really need to realize is that electrons, while we think of them as particles, and that's how we're going to refer to them, really uh, it, it's uh, in physics level, it's a mathematical representation of where electrons are at any given point in time, uh, like we talked about the other day. Okay, the next part you're going to need to know about electrons is the electron configurations will give us the shape of uh, the path of travel of the electrons. This really doesn't become as important for us, but it's a nice foundational piece uh, to have because what you're going to find is the electron configurations will uh, also give us a clue as to why the periodic table is arranged uh, the way it is. Lorenzo the other day asked about uh, if the periodic table was just like that or if we made it be like that. So hopefully we'll gain another layer of understanding uh, as to how the periodic table is all put together. Okay. Uh, on your papers, let's just take a look. Uh, if you draw um, three circles on there, um, which are going to go back to what we should already know about the Bohr model of the atom, and we're going to use the element sodium, to begin our transition from Bohr models to electron configurations. And we know because we've looked it up before, and you can look it up on your periodic tables again, that sodium has uh, 11 protons. And if it doesn't have any charge whatsoever, and we're counting, I, if I have 11 positives, uh, I'm going to need to have 11 electrons. And you know from uh, what we've looked at so far is um, and so the 11 positives would be in the middle. I'm not going to write them in here. Things are going to just get a little too bulky. So each of these layers are going to represent uh, electron um, shells. Uh, talk about, or, or you could call them orbitals sometime, but we're going to be a little more specific with our language today on what we call an orbital. So we know that I've got to put 11 electrons in here. So we're going to put two electrons in on the first energy level. I don't know why those boxes pop up. And we're going to put eight electrons in the second energy level. And there is a reason why they're paired up here. Just uh, understand that that's the nature for now. So I placed 10, and I know I've got to place 11 in there. So we're going to place the 11th one in. And we know that because we just stated the other day, um, there's a certain amount of electrons that can go in each ring, and that's because of the wave nature of these and why um, they, only certain ones will fit in, try to move in there because of the attractive and repulsive forces of the nucleus, the protons that are in there, as well as the repulsive forces of these electrons. So we've got our 11 electrons placed. 
But when we start to identify these or give them a little more specific clarity on, on where they're at, we need to be able to refer to these energy levels. So we give these energy levels numbers. So the first one closest to the nucleus is energy level one. And the second one, because you're smart people probably know, that's energy level two. And as we work our way out here, that's energy level three. And we said that those rings relate to the periodic table because each period is assigned a certain number, and that number corresponds to whichever energy level it is. So take a minute, talk to your partners, and uh, Mr. Weber, maybe pause it and say, well, how many of these orbitals do you think is the maximum that we can have in any atom? What's the total? What's the maximum that these go in neutral atoms? We're not going to get into ions yet or excited electrons, but how many rings are maximum that we could have in a neutral atom? Go ahead and discuss that now. So I hope you discussed it. Uh, I hope you pause it a little bit and come back. And if you didn't, then you're all laughing right now that uh, you didn't pause it. I'm just going to give you the answer. If you think about it, if you look at the number of periods or the number of rows on the periodic table, really we can have three, four, five, six, seven. And that's in that uh, foundational piece, the main part of the periodic table. We'll talk about the other two rows down below eventually, um, the, the lanthanide and aconite series down, down the bottom periodic table. I'm just not going to refer to that right now. Okay. Well, we've talked about Democritus, Dalton, Thompson, Rutherford, and Bohr, and these, this is the Bohr model of the atom. And you know that what we've talked about so far is that these can hold a certain amount of electrons in each one because of how they fit. And we talked about how this was 2, 8, 18. You'll remember those numbers. But let's bring a little bit more clarity to that and see why that is the case. On your papers, I would like you to draw a rectangle. That didn't work well. And it came out to more of a square, but that's okay. And on this rectangle, we're going to put layers in. And make sure you have four shells. I like to refer to this as the Heinz bookcase model. You don't have to if you don't want to. And it only works for a certain level. And the only reason I call it this is because I want to see my name up next to Democritus, Dalton, Thompson, Rutherford, and Bohr. Um, but I'm going to give you an analogy here. And the analogy is going to hopefully help you um, begin to understand how the electrons move in and around the nucleus. So hopefully if you had a chance to draw that bookcase, we're going to come back to that. Um, but I'm going to give you a little overview of what we're going to fill our bookcase with. Within each of these layers, I'm just going to redraw our... Uh, sodium atom here a minute. Bohr said that these electrons traveled in circles, but when the quantum mechanical guys came along, they said, well, that's kind of not really completely true, that there's actually shapes that these electrons travel in. It's the path of travel. And so, and we designate them with letters. So when we talk about these, these really are the shapes of orbitals that we're going to talk about here. So below the bookshelf, you can draw the idea of shapes of orbitals. And within these, 
we talk about an orbital having an S shape. It's just a regular S. That was part of me writing there. And an S-shaped orbital is spherical. It's three dimensions. It's like a little marble. It's a sphere. We could also have a P shape or P orbital, and I like to refer to the P as peanut shaped. Now within a P or the P, there's really three lobes to it. The path of travel the electrons can travel in is they can travel along the Y axis or up and down. They can travel along the X axis, left and right, or they can travel along the Z axis. So if I were to draw this, Try that again. Travel along the z-axis, they would travel away from you and then back out towards you. So three dimensions. So these are shapes of orbitals now. The d orbital, uh, you don't have to know the shape of that. We just call it disturbing. So disturbing that you don't have to memorize it. You do have to know the s and the p. And then the f orbital. Uh, these are fantastic um, to the point where we can forget about it. So forget about the shapes, but we'll, we need to know some information about it, just not the shapes. And I'll show those to you when I come in uh, on Tuesday. We'll get to these. Well, within each of these orbitals, an orbital describes at most two electrons, the path of travel. And so what happens here is um, in the pathway of an S, an S has one pathway. It's spherical. So if it only has one pathway, it can only hold two electrons. So we say S is hold two electrons. It's just that those two electrons are traveling in a sphere shaped. In the P orbital, the P orbitals have what we call three pathways, and really each of these is a is an orbital, suborbital, three pathways. So this pathway can hold two electrons, this pathway can hold two electrons, this pathway can hold two electrons. And so the P orbitals can hold at most six electrons. The d orbital, and it gets really confusing when we start looking at the geometry of this, has five pathways or five lobes. Again, these are math, really mathematical representations of how electrons travel. It has five pathways. I can put two electrons in each of the pathways. So a d orbital, d level, can hold at most 10 electrons. And just moving on here, trying to look at a little bit of a trend. The f layers, the f sublevels, the f orbitals, have seven pathways. We can put two electrons into each of the pathways, because that's the orbital, so they can hold up to 14 electrons. So I want you to remember those numbers. Um, let me just uh, review them real quick. An S can hold two electrons. A P can hold six electrons. A D can hold 10 electrons, and an F can hold 14 electrons. Well, within these circles over here, within the layers, you find various pathways that the electrons can travel within each of these layers. So atoms are like 
ogres or onions. They have layers, and we got to kind of peel this back, and hopefully it won't stink too much for us. So we're going to go back to the Heinz bookcase model, and I'm going to show you how these pathways fit and compare back to the atom in the bookcase. Okay, so let's think of the layers of the bookcase as being energy levels. So we'll pretend that the nucleus, nucleus is the ground level here, or the lowest level, and so everything's trying to fall towards the nucleus. If these shells weren't here, they would fall. What that does then is, is it makes the bookshelves equivalent to the rings or to the shells of the atom. So energy level one is going to be our bookcase one. Energy level two, shelf two. Energy level three, shelf three. And my bookcase only works up no, in really three and a half. It doesn't even work for four. But I'm doing this so that I can show you how many electrons go in each one. So in the first energy level, it is made up of an S-shaped orbital only. The second energy level is made up of two types of path of travel of electrons. It's made up of an S and a P. The third energy level is made up of an S, a P, and it has a D in there. So you can see how we start to look at how many layers are in each energy level. And I suspect you're probably, I hope, maybe you're predicting ahead here. The fourth energy level has four compartments or four different pathways electrons can travel. They have an S, a P, a D, and an F. Now, just so we're clear here, if I have in the first energy level an S, that's different than an energy level two that has an S. And the P in energy level 2 is different than the third level P, and the fourth level P, third level D is different than the fourth level D. Actually, if you, if you think about it in terms of geometry, the energy levels get bigger, and the electrons get further away as these energy levels get bigger uh, over here. Um, and then the orbitals help you describe really that path of travel. All right, so let's relate this back. If I go back and check, and I remember that my S's can have 2's, my P's can have 6, my D's can have 10, and my F's can have 14. Now we can start to see how, in the past, we learned different energy levels hold different number of electrons. I'll write these in red here. So if I have the first energy level has an S, how many electrons can it hold? Well, S's, we said, are spherical shape. They can hold 2 electrons. Moving on to the second energy level, how many total electrons can I put in? How many will fit around that? We know that an S, and again, this is a different S than the 1S, so an S can hold two electrons. Go back over here, realize that the P's can hold six. So I put six electrons in there. I should have, oops. I should have written down here that I can have a total of two electrons on the first energy level. In the second energy level, I can put two in an S shape. I can put six in a P shape. So at the second energy level, I can have eight electrons. I'm sure you're predicting ahead. I hope you are. If I move up to the third energy level, two electrons are going to move in an S shape. Six electrons are going to move in a P shape. I go back. I see that the Ds can hold 10 electrons. Total those up. Oh, those are electrons, electrons. The third energy level can hold 18 electrons. And looking ahead to the fourth, oops, wrong annotation there. I know that an S can hold two electrons, a P can hold six electrons, a D can hold 10 electrons, an F can hold 14 electrons for a total of 32 electrons. 
So this starts to build to 8, 18, 32, and it would continue if we ran it up to 5, 6, and 7 to energy levels. Um, but we're going to work on this for right now. This is really enough to handle. Okay. If we use this then and start to give addresses to electrons, I'm going to copy my sodium atom. I'm going to copy my sodium atom. Go to this new page. I'm also going to steal my bookcase. And you have this on your paper to refer back to. Now we have those two things that we can reference. I want to give an electron configuration model for the sodium atom. And it helps us do this in clear, concise fashion without going through all of this nonsense of writing this all out this way. Okay. So let's begin. I'm going to write an electron configuration for s sodium. What that means is we're going to put these electrons into our order. All right, here we go. We're going to fill these up. So the first thing that I do is I say, okay, the electrons are going to get as close to the nucleus as they can. They're going to fill up each level first. Just like if you were putting books on a shelf, you'd fill up the first one and then the second one and then the third one and then the fourth one. So we're going to fill these up with 11 electrons. So I go this way. In the first energy level, so I have first energy level, In an S shape, I know that's going to travel in an S shape. The next question is how do I put how many electrons can travel in there? The S can hold two electrons, so I'm going to write a little superscript two up there. So what that tells me is in the first energy level, in an S shape, two electrons are traveling in that shape. Well, that's full now. I can't put any more in there because in my layer here, I have filled up my bookshelf. Or I, I no more can fit in that orbital. So now i got to go up to the next layer up here. Well, what does that look like? What that looks like then is I, got, I have nine more to place. I have 11 total to place. I've only placed two. So in the second energy level, Second energy level. In the S shape, I'll write that a little better. I can put two electrons. Well, that still only has me placing four electrons. I've got seven more to go. Where do they go? In the second energy level, I can fit some more. But what I need to say is, if they're in this energy level, what shape are they going to be traveling in? They're going to be now traveling in a P-shaped pathway. <laughs> How many can I fit in there? I can fit six traveling that pathway. Well, I've got two, four, 
10 electrons placed. I'm starting to give them addresses. I've got to get to 11. That means I have one more to place. Well, I can't put them in the first energy level. It's full. I can't put them in the second energy level. It's full. So I'm going to have to go up to the third energy level. The third energy level, I start with the S's. So let's just do that. I know what the third energy level in an S shape. Hmm, it holds 18 electrons, but I don't have 18 electrons to put in there. I've already put 10. I've only got one electron to put in there. And if you recall, we talked about how the alkali metals only have one electron in there. So we can actually see that correlation back up here. Here's the one electron right there. And that one electron is being described right there. So we made that connection. So in the third energy level traveling in an S shape, I have one electron. So what this does then is it tells us that the electron configuration for sodium is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Okay, I'll let you get your brains around that just a little bit. If it was hydrogen, take a guess as to what that might be. Think through that. Now, I will tell you that my bookcase model only works to help get you started with this. What you'll find is if we get higher up in the energy levels, they overlap a little bit and they don't fill up in a nice, neat, particular order as we find it here on the bookcase. Uh, it takes a little more work for that. So I'm going to copy this bookcase again. Let me group this. I lost something there. Let me just copy this. <coughs> Excuse me. here. And let's look at chlorine. Because we did this one the other day and you know the at least the energy levels for it. We know that chlorine has 17 protons, 17 electrons. So we'll put two. And then I'm just, um, I don't need to write them all out. Uh, I'm going to go eight. So two and then eight would fit on the second energy level. That's 10. And then I've got seven to place. So I'm going to go one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I'm not concerned about, well, they pair up and we'll talk about why later. All right, let's go through this looking at the bookcase. Just always starting closest to the nucleus. So I'm going to have in the first energy level in an S orbital, two electrons will be traveling. Now it's full. So I got to go to the next one. In the second energy level, in the S sublevel, two electrons will be placed. I've got to put, uh, if I have 17 and I've used four, I've got 13 more to go. Well, I still have room on the second energy level. I can put six in the P uh, level, the P pathway. 
That's 2 plus 2 is 4 plus 6 is 10. But the second energy level is full, and I've got to get up to a little bit more, so I'm going to go to the 3. Now I've got to fill up the S first. The S is the lowest. Put two electrons in there. 2, 4, 10, 12. 17 minus 12. i got five more to place, so I'm at the third energy level. I can go to the P. And up the P orbital will hold six, but I don't have that many to put in there. But I do have five to put in there. So this is the electron configuration for chlorine. That should get you started. Um, thank you for uh, being attentive. Uh, ran a little bit longer than I should, but um, hopefully you've got the detail now. I will also post this on Google Classroom, uh, and you can go back and refer to it as you do your homework tonight. Thank you, Mr. Weber. Thank you, guys. Have a great day.